And here to tell you a little bit more about that is Professor Jing Zhu. Not only that, 
viruses hijack these uh, machineries. Uh, we are seeing these green dots that are moving inside of the infected axons through their own processes. And these green dots are cookies viruses. <laughs> some, <laughs> some more viruses understand them and uh, I feel challenged. <laughs> so, okay, let's see. Now, you wait, so it's a piece of uh, axon and uh, here is a cartoon of a type of a special cell in, inside the box, which is the neurons and these molecules are carrying um, materials back and forth from the cell body, which is from your uh, central nervous system, to the tip of the uh, neuronal processes, and sometimes to the fingers, sometimes to the uh, toes. On the really, really tall person, there can be uh, a nature, which is, which is six orders magnitude longer than the individual travel distance of these molecules. So it's pretty difficult to test. You might ask me what have these cargoes. They can be neurotransmitters, they can be survival signals, <coughs> neurotransmitters from the cell body to the term, to the distal area, and survival signal from the distal area back to the cell body. Okay, so it's universal to all cells in humans. Because of that, it, the failure in these fundamental building blocks becomes the issue. It underlines the number of diseases which is uh, including the neural uh, degeneration as well as uh, cancer. So when I was a postdoc at Irvine, I was fortunate enough to be part of a study where we found out the mechanism for one type of uh, effect, failure in these molecules, how you can, how, why and how it can lead to um, logarithmic like diseases in mice models. So the, it's essentially the defect molecules don't travel as long, so they cannot effectively shuttle things materials to that destination. So this is kind of depressing, right? I'm going to like you in this The uh, flow design is that it enables everyday function. So <laughs> it includes vision, hearing, cell division, and for if statistics is right, for roughly half of you, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 mobile. Uh, so, sperms will have to swim to find an unfertilized uh, sperm eggs to inject its DNA, which is uh, somewhere here. And the ability to swim long range is all happens in the tail. And it's these two components that enables this uh, tail and swim. If you're interested, I have a one final slide to show these. A sort of uh, handshake, hand waving like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I want to study these, but cells are very, very messy. So all these happens in the cell, and there are different types of cargoes, and there are different numbers of modules per cargo. And this is just way too overwhelming. There's a feedback mechanism. It's best left for the biochemist, uh, biologist experts to do. Now what we do is to look at these modules in minimal system to study them. First, what does the capacitor do? What does the uh, resistor do? What, what, what happens to our RC circuit and so on to building it up from the minimal system? So we have them in the uh, test tube and uh, the two components, molecular modules and microtubules in the test tube, in a well clean and well controlled environment. And the tools that I use um, predominantly is called optical track. It's basically just a manual uh, version of a tractor beam <laughs> to move really tiny objects around. It's a focused laser spot that interacts with the dielectric sphere, which, um, such as a glass bead or plastic beads, and it takes advantage of the, uh, of the, of the, the light property, which is it bends as it crosses the boundary of a true medium. So if you go home and make some red, je uh, red jello, all green jello, and shine a laser, uh, uh, laser pointer through across the boundary, if you are not shining it straight up, you will see at the angle, you will see that angle changes as the laser light and entry or exit the uh, jello. That's because the, it's across the boundary of two medium that has different index of refraction. Now, if you bend the light, so 
So you can play tricks to have different amount of intensity of wave that bends at different angle that imparts certain amount of momentum in a certain direction onto that plastic of, of, of glass bead. And the net result of it is that the, the bead will want to be globally confined to the center of the laser beam. So that's called a laser trap or a laser tre tweezer. It's uh, developed by Arthur Rushkin when laser this thing first came into a reality in, in uh, late 70s and uh, used by Stephen Chu to trap really uh, to trap neutral atoms and won a prize in 1997 and pioneered by Stephen Block to do single molecule studies. Now, let's see, so the ability to, so, so why do we use it for single molecule kind of studies? It's because these motors, that, as Rick pointed out, is really, really tiny. They're about 80 nanometers long, 20 or 10 nanometers across. It's just impossible to see uh, optically, unless you fluorescent and label it, which is a whole other awesome technique. <laughs> that is new stick papers. Uh, you can combine it with, with the So, so if you want to manipulate uh, these motors spatially, you uh, stick it under the heat and then use the laser trap to move it around. Here is a trick that's made by one of my summer students, <laughs> just uh, moving around a dielectric beam, a plastic beam, instead of a, a field of view that, that's, fall, that's superimposed with a micro maze. So the cross section, so the length of this is about 20 micro, where the size of that is about, if you take a piece of my hand and divide the width of it by five times, that's the plastic <laughs> <laughs> So here there's no motors on this, the, on this beam, and you cannot see the laser trap because I've put a filter, I have a filter in front of the camera, but you can see that the, the position of the piece is uh, relatively steerable. Now you can coat the piece with motors and then bring it to my continuous that are pre-fixed on the glass surface. The advantage of this is that the interaction between the motors and the microtubules are then the walking interaction. What that means is that the further away it is, the less likely they're going to come together and, um, and allow me to take data. So <laughs> if I use optical trap to bring them together, then I can observe that interaction. So pictorially, you can see here, I have a B that, that's coded with any number of motors that's controllable by me in a well uh, in a self-ray environment and positioned above the microtubule as a prefix <coughs> on the glass surface. And we can observe it. So in the previous slide you saw this beam image. We're using some sort of uh, interference uh, interferometry that's built into the microscope. Uh, differential interference contrast microscopy. So a pretty uh, standard te te technique. What it results is, the result of it is that you can see reasonably small things, such as 20 micro, 20 nanometers uh, in that into, uh, which is the width of the microtubule. But uh, a side effect is that a spherical particle will look half white and half black. And when you see that image, you know that it's in the field of the view. So we can watch, we can grab a bead, position it onto the microtubule, and just watch it go. We can measure velocity, travel distance, and force. This is conceptually is exactly the same as uh, what we do in physics one last. You take a ball, you drop it on an in, uh, incline or decline, and watch uh, how, how fast it's uh, uh, running down the hill. Now, this type of uh, technique allows us to really make these animations. These animations are uh, not just dreamt up, <laughs> but rather uh, they'll put together <coughs> based on what we have learned through optical tracking studies as well as fluorescence studies. These sort of hand overhead type of motion. And I saw this in 2006 and when I was working for a job, first time of grad school. And uh, I fell in love with it. I just wanted to know everything about this molecular motors, even though I failed biology in high school. <laughs> <laughs> My school was uh, a steady 33%. 
whether or not they are positive at the same position. And there are some, uh, some example traces. You see that y-axis is position and axis is, is time. This, these flat lines indicate pause is not changing of uh, position with time. And if I look at how often they pause along certain direction, certain position along the magnitude you can see that there are preferred pause locations. And if I make magnitude in a specific way, since that there are more defects in some populations and there are less defects in some populations, and compare them in parallel, I see that the probability of pausing, the pausing frequency, probability that I will see pauses along uh, the contributors of each population is more uh, when there is more deep, when I know that the magnitude is, is more uh, imperfect versus uh, less likely to pause when the magnitude is more perfect. So the more mean, means that all the scattered uh, falls into the upper point. This line indicates one to one. So if there is no relations, all the dots will be along this line. And if there's more probability of falling uh, of pausing along a perfect magnitude, you'll see other dots on the bottom uh, half. So that's consistent with the hypothesis that imperfection perhaps interferes with our public mobility work. But these are unseen bi biology, I can only speculate. So the extent check is really good. And if I don't send check, my colleagues will say, what if? <laughs> How do you know it's not the other interpretation? And it's a really good question, right? So what we do is to look at not only the actual position, which is how the motors are moving, how the beam is moving along the microtubule, but also the motion perpendicular to the microtubule. And from the actual position, we can find out where the pauses are occurring and look at where the, the corresponding position of the beam in the uh, direction that's perpendicular to the microtubule. And the idea is that, okay, so my tubule only has certain width. If the, so it's possible that these pulses are really just arising from some sort of artifact of bees somehow interacting with the glass surface, because the microtubule is sitting on the glass surface. Maybe the bees are just running into the glass surface, and just like you are driving on the highway, perhaps are stopping because the car is running into the curbside. So the curves are on the edge of the road. So I'm looking at whether or not the pauses happen um, predominantly along the edge of the microtubule. And here are the raw, raw data of the uh, position of the beads that are in the direction of perpendicular to the microtubule. And this little blue uh, distribution is where the pauses occur. We can do some sort of failure to filter out noise, which is this red lines. So that we can overestimate the width of the magnitude of landscape, the road width, and still find that the location of the pauses in the direction is perpendicular to the road. And doing this, we can divide up the landscape of the magnitude in the perpendicular direction into three sections: the middle section, the sides, and the very edge. So if you view this as a submultilane highway. The very edge will be where the curves are. So we're testing whether or not the pausing are occurring when the bees are just not specifically running to the glass surface. So will, if that were true, I will see all the pauses happening on the very edge. Plotting here are the probability of the half of uh, seeing a pause in the middle of the road, on the side of the road. This, uh, and on the very edge of the road. And we see, what we see is that we have an equal likelihood of pausing in anywhere perpendicular to the road. So that means that my pauses are not due to the bees are interacting with, not specifically with the glass surface. And that was a huge relief. <laughs> we have <laughs> preferences, but. Okay, so we can change the type of, uh, change how we put together these assembly <laughs> cell lenses to have more or less defects. And the pauses that we see are 
again, independent of, uh, is not, is not due to the artifact where the bees are running into the glass surface. So we can do one more thing, which is to reduce, uh, to look at the travel distance. What, we, what I have shown you thus far is uh, bees coated with many, many motors, so they travel very, very long distance. In fact, if you think back to the neurons, uh, it's one meter, uh, it, it, it's a very long distance to travel, so how can you possibly achieve that distance? One, one way is to have multiple motors. But we can dial down that multiple motors because my microscope is only, say, 20 microns in, in, in field of view, so I want to measure some distance that's uh, measurable. If everything will come to the view that and I'll measure the average distance. So here we track the beam positioning on my scope or my tubule, and then let it drop and then it falls off. When it falls off, you no longer see this well-defined uh, rule of black and white feature. It's because the interference pattern changes uh, of the beam changes once the de deviates from that focal point. And we uh, look at the travel distances. The, the take home is that, so x-axis is how far the bees travel, y-axis is the population, how many of the events that happen. The, the more crunched it looks like, the shorter the travel distance will be. And the wider, the more extended the, the, the distribution looks like, the more bars there are, the greater the travel distance will be. And the difference is so these, these two are significantly different, and these two are significantly different. What's different about them? They're starting with, uh, I'm using the same population with these, so we go to with motors, but the only difference between them is that there are different magnitudes. So, so when you dial down the number of motors, um, so they have a chance of, the beam has a chance of dissociating from the hypertribute, how far they travel is also dependent on the hypertribute uh, that they travel on. Um, so the to long well, story short, what we find is that imperfection in the road condition matters just like the micro scale matters for how these molecular motors travel. If you have imperfections here, you can lead to different if you're watching the cargo transport motion, it can uh, serve different type of motion. If you have a lot of motors, here there is only one motor. Uh, carrying the cargo. If you have a lot of motors to carry the cargo, you'll see pause events before you zoom into go. Pause and pause. But if you have just a few motors that are carrying the cargo, you will have premature dissociation at the imperfection side. So this is, uh, uh, of course, I'm not a biologist. I'm only speculating here. Uh, our favorite speculation is that Perhaps imperfection, um, rather than viewed as our enemy, perhaps we can view it as one more degree of control in regulating how materials are shuttled around in our cells. Maybe we can take advantage of it instead of just go, go, go. We can say, all right, so if we put more motors on this, we can have cargos that are just meandering and pausing and go. Um, for example, well, well, I don't want to speak too much. Um, but if we want to uh, lead to pre the unloading of cargo from the microtubule, maybe we will have fewer motors, but uh, locate the imperfection sites at the unloading sites. So, uh, to summarize, what I think I'm proposed, I feel like me. Uh, lucky to every day to be able to really work on the nano version of cleaning a part of cloth or a foam, whatever you use the foam for. Um, and uh, the data that I showed you today is uh, predominantly uh, analyzed and done by Huni Liu, who's an undergraduate student in my lab. And uh, it's uh, in collaboration with a, a wonderful theorist and a wonderful biochemist who isolate these images for, for us. And we're supported by NIH, uh, James McDonald's Foundation and you see me sad collectively. I want to thank you again and happy to take questions.
they exert they impart momentum on the plastic beans. So the momentum uh, is uh, is equivalent to, to a force. So the net force is towards the center of the laser focus. In a in a very uh, the way I view it is that uh, the the optical track is a three dimensional spring. <laughs> so so the B is the small further away from it the greater the force. Just like physics one, the Hokkien, yeah, uh, Hokkien force, I believe, uh, you measure the force from a string based on the dis displacement of the string from its very last position. Of course, just like the string, if you are too far away, you know, it, it, it breaks down and then the voltage just breaks off. <laughs>